Let's uh, pray together before we come to the Bible. Let's pray. Father, as always, we uh, come to your word as we do each week. And we today we are just reminded of, uh, Lord, our need to, to walk in humility before you. And so as we come to your word, Lord, we, we want to come in that manner and in that posture, uh, not as people who think we understand everything, not as people who are experts, and not as people who are... Uh, feel an academic or uh, just people that think we've got a grasp on everything we want to come in order to receive your word uh, that's uh, your word for, which is from you not from me or any other person uh, and we ask that you would speak to us this morning uh, Lord that we would hear what you have to say to us today because we know your word is alive and you speak to your people today and so we ask that you would speak uh, give us ears to hear give us understanding uh, give us clarity and um, then may this time around your word really edify us and encourage us and grow our love for you and our desire to be more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Excuse me. I want you this morning, if you can, to cast your mind back to your primary school sports days. Now, I'm, I may be treading on dangerous ground there, but just to, uh, <laughs> uh, if you can, think back to those days, whenever that was for you, and try and remember some of the events you took part in, various races. I was thinking about it this week and thinking, who came up with these things? A sack race? You know, who, who decided we're going to get in a sack and we're just going to jump in that direction? Or egg and spoon race? I'd love to know the story behind that one. But one of the, the classic ones was the three-legged race. Do you remember doing the three-legged race? Okay, so, uh, the three-legged race. Now, you're doing the th three-legged race. I remember that either going really, really well or absolutely awful, depending on who you got paired with. So you got paired with someone, and that sometimes you get paired with somebody, and it's just perfect. You're in sync. It's like you were, you know, athletic soulmates, you know, just running down there in your three-legged race with a thing tied between you. And you could win or at least not come last, which in my view is usually the goal on these kind of events. Don't come last. Uh, that's a high standard to set. But um, other times you got paired with somebody and it was just a disaster. You spend the whole time falling around. The thing would come undone, tripping over one another, uh, going the wrong way. Now imagine that happened. Imagine during a three-legged race somebody just said, I want to go that direction instead. Like, well, the, the finishing line's that way. Why are we going to go that way? Or they just wanted to stop instead of had enough and I'm done. Or tripping up other people along the way while you go down this uh, down this racetrack. Now you might be wondering why I'm I'm talking about that. Well, for me, in getting my head around what Paul is saying here, it's actually a bit of a helpful illustration. Because uh, what Paul is talking about here, that's maybe a, a funny thing to think about. Thinking back to our three-legged race days, unless you're still doing them, but but when we used to do those. But Paul's given a very serious command here. Paul's talking about something very serious indeed. In this command here where he says in verse 14, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Uh, now, being a, a boy that grew up going to church and going to Sunday school, I never really understood what it was to be yoked. I couldn't help but think of eggs whenever that word was mentioned, which I thought that cannot be what Paul is talking about and is definitely not what he's talking about. But it's a very serious command that we need to take seriously and really understand what is Paul saying here. What's Paul saying here? So the way I'm approaching this passage this morning is basically the way I approached it when I was preparing it myself was with many a question <laughs> regarding this passage. What, what is being said here? What's being got across? Well, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now, most of us probably stop there and go, hang on, what does, what, what's, what does that mean? What, are all, what does even all those words mean? Well, this was a reference that would have been more clearly understood in Paul's day, perhaps, than it is now in our modern culture, modern society. And uh, some people would understand this uh, better than others. But um, the, the image that it brings up and would have brought up for the people, particularly, I think, maybe some of the Jewish people in the congregation, but not, not solely, uh, was this image, a kind of agricultural image, really, of two animals being hitched together in such a way you can picture the, the things around their neck to plough a field. But they're, they're being hitched together. Okay, so, and you see this sometimes in, 
Uh, even in the Old Testament, actually, there's certain commands given in both Leviticus and Deuteronomy to not hitch two animals together that are, are different, right? So don't hitch them together if they're different animals, because that's that, that won't go. We don't understand fully all of the reasons for that. It may have been a reminder to the people of their separateness. It may have just been for practical reasons. But that's the picture that we're given of two animals being kind of hitched together um, and, and uh, very tightly knit in that way. And working together, working together in that way that they're doing something together. So he's, saying to, he's using that image and saying to these Christian people, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. You don't have to picture your own head in one of these things, but it's a helpful image to help us think through what does this mean? What does this mean? Well, I think what he's talking about, and I wouldn't be alone in this, is that uh, believers are not to be uh, united spiritually to people in a worship sense who are not Christians, who are not believers. So what we're going to look at is maybe some of the ways of what this does mean or how this applies and some of the ways which this doesn't mean because I think this passage has been misunderstood or misused uh, down the years as well. So what would this have looked like for the uh, people in Corinth? What would this have, uh, have, have looked like for them? Well, uh, uh, and first of all, to kind of back up my reasoning for, for saying what I've just said, Paul gives a, a bunch of rhetorical questions. So there are questions that there's a very clear answer to, right? Um, so, you know, we think of rhetorical questions today. People say, you know, is the Pope a Catholic? Well, yes, the Pope is a Catholic. Paul, Paul's looking for obvious answers here. He knows uh, what he's, he's trying to say. He begins by saying, what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? What partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Now, righteousness being those who live in the ways of Christ, who are seeking righteousness and looking to live righteously, as opposed to those who have no desire to follow Christ and walk in his ways, in the ways of lawlessness, where we walked before we knew Christ. What partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Well, well, none, spiritually speaking, none. Or what fellowship has light with darkness? These are common themes in the Bible. Uh, light and darkness. I think of John's gospel particularly. Uh, the themes of light and darkness really run through that book. And Jesus himself is described as the light of the world. If we go further back than that, uh, we see the people of Israel being described as a light to the nations around them. They were to be holy. They were to be separate. They were to, to sort of shine God's light to the nations around them. Jesus himself comes as the light of the world and shines light into the sinful, dark world. And if you remember, we were going through Philippians, what well, feels like quite a while ago now, actually, we were going through Philippians, and uh, today Christians are encouraged to shine as lights in the darkness, in the midst of a crooked and a twisted generation. Uh, so we are to shine as the light. So there's light and darkness, and those who know God live and walk in the light and the knowledge of his glory. Even in, in 2 Corinthians 4, there's references to that, isn't it, that uh, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So we to live in the light, not in the darkness. And so there's, not, there's no fellowship, uh, spiritual fellowship between those who are in the light and those who are in the dark. What accord has uh, Christ with Belial? Now that may be another question for you who's Who's, um, who's Belial? <laughs> who's, what, what, is, what does that word mean? Who, who are we talking about there? Well, this word actually at its root can mean worthlessness. or uh, it's, just, it's, a, it's a negative word. But it was used in the Judaism of Paul's day by the rabbis and, and people like that as a way of describing Satan, as a way of talking about the evil one. So Paul's saying, well, what accord has Christ with Belial? Well, none. There's no union there. There should be no union there. That there isn't any. I remember we were described as those who used to walk and follow the prince of the power of the air before we ourselves were saved. Before we knew Jesus and so the world remains in his grasp until they come to know Christ. Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? Often in the Old Testament, God is described as our portion. Isn't he? I love that in Psalm 73. When the, the psalmist, he looks out on the world around him, he looks out on the wealthy and the wicked and how they prosper. He says, this, what's going on here? But then he's reminded that he has a greater portion. That God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. 
Whom have I in heaven but you? There's nothing on the earth that I desire beside you. That's, that's my portion. You have your portion. The world has its portion, but we have God. He says, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Idols being the false gods that are worshipped in the world around us all the time. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? None. So having understood this a, a little bit better, or hopefully a little bit better, looking at this, that th there should be not a, a spiritual uniting of believers and unbelievers in a way that they're sort of worshipping together, worshipping false gods together. How does Paul specifically apply this to the Corinthian situation? My thinking, what does it mean for them in this moment? What, what, what's going on in the Corinthians context that they need to be reminded of this? Well, it could be a variety of things. Um, for our visitors, we've been going through this letter and we've seen that within the context to the church in Corinth, Paul has been having to correct them and rebuke them because there are certain people who have come into the congregation and have infiltrated it and are leading people away from the true gospel. And they're saying Paul's not the real deal. He's not God's man. Uh, and they're criticizing him for all kinds of reasons. They're trying to... Uh, misconstrue situations so that he looks to be a liar and a man that doesn't keep his word and they're saying he's not God's man how could he be God's apostle look at all his sufferings and his weakness and his, he's, his, he's useless uh, and he's sadly they're successfully leading some of the people away from the true gospel from the true Jesus and Paul's encouraging them to cast these people out discipline them remove them from your midst and so there's one sense that many people think it could apply. I think this is fair. is to say that part of what it means for them to not be unequally yoked with unbelievers is to be listening to these false teachers and their false doctrine and the way that they are leading them away from Christ. He even, Paul even suggests that some of these people aren't even believers. And that danger is very much still today. False teachers haven't gone away. They're all over the place. And fortunately, they're more accessible because we can see them all on, online. There's some very good uh, wonderful gospel preaching people that's because God builds his church and God keeps his church but we must be aware of being led away by false gospels by false teachers and false prophets and actually hitching ourselves to them instead of to Christ something that sounds more appealing in the moment than the true gospel of Jesus another example for the Corinthians could be uh, in Corinth at the time, there would have been all kinds of idols worshipped. False temples, all kinds of things going on. It probably wouldn't be too different to Athens, where Paul just walks about Athens and is overwhelmed by the idolatry in the place and the number of false gods. Even the altar there that's described to the unknown God. It's just to the unknown God. There's one for him as well. There's gods everywhere. This was not an atheistic society in which the Corinthians were living. There was all kinds of idols all over the place. And it could be tempting for new believers in Corinth and the church to sort of mix and match a little bit. Sort of like pick and mix kind of faith. And this is what the people of Israel were terribly guilty of in the Old Testament. This um, what people call syncretism. Where it's not that they're just outright abandoning the God of Israel. They're, they're kind of hanging on to the God of Israel. But they're bringing in a bit of Baal. Because we like some of the things that Baal lets us do. And he appeals to us in this kind of way. So we'll try and keep it a bit and we'll try and mix and match and sort of have the two together. And so they're, they're in, to use the phrase, they're unequally yoked. They're mixing their gods. They're mixing their idols. And it's, um, if we think these kind of things have gone, if we think paganism is a thing of the past, we're kidding ourselves. Western society is full of it. Absolutely full of it. Uh, and uh, I mean, I, I remember we had a group of lads that used to come to our church back in, back in Elgin, and, and they would talk about all the things their parents were involved in. I mean, it just uh, everything you could think of, fortune telling, tarot cards, angels, rocks, crystals. I don't even know what half of them meant, to be honest. Um, communing with the dead, uh, horoscopes, all, it's, it's all there. You know, we can pretend it's not there, but, but it is there. And it would be very, very tempting for the Christian to say, I'll have the Bible. And I'll have Jesus. But what if, what if this thing here has got something to say? Maybe I'll just bring that in there a little bit. Maybe I could bring in another idol. And maybe I could just bring in this. And so our devotion to God is, is, well, it's not devotion to God. It's a mixing of idols. It's a mixing 
of things mingling in a way that is, is not right. It's wrong and it's sinful and we need to put it down. What place has light with darkness? None. That's what we're meant to say to that. And it could also be seen in the way we relate to other faiths and religions and cults. Um, one of the things that, one of the tricky things can be, how do, how do we relate? We want to have a relationship with them, but what does that look like? I know of a guy I studied with and where he lived, it was, there was a heavy Muslim population. And he said, how do I reach Muslim people? And one of the things that he did was he found some common ground on social issues. So they, they started this pro-life charity because he said, well, the, the, the Muslim people in my community are pro-life. And so we started this charity, but none of them at, the, at that point were saying we worship the same God because they were good Muslims <laughs> and that he was a good Christian. And they said, well, we found some common ground here. And that was his way of reaching Muslims because he says, well, I can connect on some common ground. But the danger comes when we begin to say we worship the same God and we can do these things together. And I don't know if this is still as common anymore, but there was a time when people were quite into interfaith services. We can't have interfaith services. That, I mean, that's just, it's just a different God. It's a mixing of idols. We can't worship together because we don't worship the same God. And in a, in a society and in a context that pushes that and would have us believe that uh, and that would have us put down in the exclusive claims of Jesus. If we want to, people say, why are you so exclusive? Just point to Jesus. It's a great thing to do. Well, he said, <laughs> Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. And so we have to put away those things. It's not that we don't love those people. Of course we love those people. They're people made in the image of God and they're lost. And they need Jesus just the same way. I needed Jesus, still need Jesus every, every day. We pray for them, we love them. Uh, but, and, but, and as we say, find ways to, to meet people and to do those things. Even work together in some ways, but we cannot worship with people who don't embrace Christ. And I don't mean just people who say they embrace Jesus, who actually believe what the Bible teaches about who Christ is. And what he has done for us. And that's not popular. It doesn't get us any brownie points in wider society. But it means it keeps us faithful to God. And keeps us proclaiming the truth. And idols come in many forms, don't they? they don't, it's not just other religions. Or faiths. We, we, we'll make a God out of anything. John Calvin famously said that um, the heart is an idol factory. You know, it just keeps producing things that we can worship. You know. Anything we look to, we'll worship uh, instead of him. Uh, but those are very perhaps specific examples. And another one, probably the most common way I've heard this verse used, I don't know if it's just from being brought up in, in church or so on, but was in relation to marriage uh, and believers looking for a spouse. And I think that, that very much applies, doesn't it? We want to marry people who are going to lead us to the finish line to go back to the, <laughs> the, the three-legged legged example. Now, what can happen sometimes is people find themselves in that situation already. And, and well, that's, you know, that's okay. You, you just witness within that situation to your spouse who might not be a believer. Or some people become Christians later on after they're married. You continue to witness and pray for your spouse who's not a believer. So I'd, I want to under, I'd understand there's caveats here, okay? There's nuances. But for, for a Christian looking for the first time thinking, who am I going to, I want to be married to someone who's going to love the Lord and who we can worship together and who we can, who will lead me in holiness and, and walk together in the ways of God. Seek partnership. Marriage is very much a spiritual union in a lot of ways, isn't it? It's a, uh, we, um, the way the Bible portrays it and, and uh, we two become one. It's a wonderful thing. And we want to, where possible, do that with someone who is, uh, who loves the Lord. Those are just some uh, examples of how that might apply to us today or how we might think about what Paul is saying here. And I'm sure you could think of many other examples that I'm sure I've missed. But what I want to talk about as well is what this doesn't mean. What this doesn't mean. Because that was other questions I had as well. So the most obvious thing for me that it doesn't mean is it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be friends with people who aren't Christians. And I think sometimes that can be uh, used in that way. I think this is talking about kind of spiritual worship together. Uh, so it doesn't mean you shouldn't be friends with people who aren't Christians. 
there may be friendships or relationships that you do have to walk away from because actually you are being led in such a way that is, I'm being led to sin. I'm being led away from God here. Or I can be friends with you, but just not in that place. I can't go to that place with you anymore. I, I, I want to love you and be near to you, but, but not in that way. I remember um, hearing a, a pastor say once, I think it was at one of the big Baptist Union conferences, he was speaking and he said, he was talking about the passage where uh, in Luke 15, Jesus is described as a friend of sinners, you know. And he said, uh, he, he said the church I grew up in, he said, we, we had no time for being a friend, <laughs> to do that kind of thing. He said, we were out every night, we were at the church every night. He says, I had the prayer meeting, youth group meeting, church meeting, probably a choir meeting or something, you know. And there was all these things, which were all good things. But he said, uh, and then they would tell us, to make sure we evangelize. And he was saying, well, I've got no time for that. So I'm in here every night with all the, all the Christians. He says, when, when are you expecting me to do that? You know? And so he, he actually, um, when he went to his first church, he said that he, he, he wanted that to be a, a bit of a, a vision almost that we had we're out and we were able to see people and share the gospel with people who are outside of Christ and give our time to people like that. I heard of another pastor who went on to plant a church in the States and he said, he, he, this was an alien concept to me. I don't know if it was growing up in Lossie where... Uh, I had, I, I think it was myself and possibly two, maybe three other people in my whole year at school that even went to church. So the idea that you could surround yourself wholly with Christians, I didn't know you could do that before heaven. You know, like, I just, where, where do you live? Can I, are you there already? I, I don't know what's going on. And it, for, So for us, we were surrounded by non-Christians all the time, but, but this guy was saying, he looked in his phone and went down his contacts one day and said, you know what, there's not an unbeliever in there. There's not somebody who's not a Christian in there. So he, I think he ended up going to work in a pub because he said, I just need to meet. I need to tell people about Jesus that don't know him yet. Years later, he came back to where he was, planted a church, and he had his first service in the back room of that pub, <laughs> which is amazing problems ago. But anyway, as an example of, uh, so it's not saying don't be out there because I think that's what Christ would do. That is what Christ would do. And we're called to be here together, but then to go out and reach people and share Christ with people. It's, it can be easy, perhaps, to surround ourselves with the wrong people, but we must, or sorry, with just Christians, uh, when actually we're called to be out and, and shine as lights in the darkness. Uh, that's uh, one example of that, I think. I mean, to make sure that we're out and about and sharing Christ with people. But having asked these questions to which he knows the answer, Paul continues, he says, for we are the temple of the living God. So he said, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. That was, I find that astonishing whenever that's said in the Bible. We are the temple of the living God. Now Paul, in his mind, and for a lot of the folk who knew the Old Testament, are thinking the temple of God was the place where God dwelt. Where the presence of God was in the Holy of Holies. This is part of the glory of being a Christian, is that we are now the temple. We don't need a temple anymore. The temple's done away with. Christ has fulfilled that. We are the temple of the living God, and that God dwells in us by his Holy Spirit. I find that astonishing. Absolutely. So that God somehow lives in me, that place that was so unapproachable in so many ways because of God's holiness. We are now the temple. God dwells within us because of what he has done for us in Christ. Because Christ has paid the penalty for our sin because he's taken it away and we have access to God in Christ and Christ dwells in us by his Holy Spirit. He dwells in his people. And so what he's saying, well, you are the holy temple of God as his people. So he said, uh, there is no place for idols. There is no place for sinful idolatry. It says, as God said, and what he does is he, he blends various quotes from the Old Testament, particularly Leviticus and Isaiah, reminding where the people were reminded that God would make my dwelling among them and walk among them. So this really goes back to the Garden of Eden before everything went wrong, before the fall. We're told that Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. That's a beautiful picture. He walked with God. There was no barrier. There was no, the cool of the day, even that phrase, it's, it's peace, it's a peace with God. But then that was broken because of sin, because of our sin. And so we are out of God's presence, but God brings us back to him in Christ. And now he walks among us, he dwells amongst us. 
I will be their God, he says, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. So there's this call to us as, to, as the temple of God not to worship idols, not to be led to worship idols, not to be led away from worshipping the one true God. Then I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Because we are his people, because we are his children, we are called to walk in holiness and purity. And so he calls us away from our idols and not to, to worship them no longer. And so you would see the people at Corinth hearing this for the first time and thinking of false teachers and thinking of the idols out on the street and down the road and the temples there that they could worship. Do not mix with that. Do not worship them. Worship me alone as your father. Spiritually speaking, touch no unclean thing. Follow the Lord Almighty. And Paul says, because of this, in, in moving to chapter 7, verse 1, he says, since we have these promises, beloved, these promises about God dwelling amongst us, about God walking with us, about God's presence and dwelling within his people, he says, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. So he says, cleanse yourself of the idols, remove them from you. And there's a wonderful thing where that, that, that can sound, command can sound a little intimidating, can't it? You bring holiness to completion in the fear of God. But we have all scripture to balance that, don't we? Again, to go back to Philippians that we looked at before, Philippians 1.6, there's this wonderful promise where Paul's writing to the Philippians. And he's, saying, I'm, he's basically saying he's encouraged by what he's seen in them. You know, he's encouraging them. And he says um, in, in chapter 1, Verse 6, he says that he who began that good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And I hear that and I think, oh, what a relief. It's not all about me doing it myself. That's fantastic. But at the same time, he does say in Philippians 2, you know, to keep it in the same letter, he says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you for his good pleasure. So there's this do it because God's doing it. <laughs> Almost idea, you know. Uh, in, in Hebrews 4, we're told to strive for that holiness without which no one will see the Lord. But we can take courage knowing that God is working in us and so we can aim for holiness. We can, uh, And part of that, particularly in this passage, is to get rid of the sin, get rid of the idols. We have to actively be at work to examine ourselves and to say, is there something there that needs dealt with? Is there some defilement of body or spirit that I need to get rid of? Is there some sin I'm caught up in? Or is there just something that's not necessarily bad, but it's just drawing away my attention and I'm making an idol out of it and it's just, it's just not good for me? Something I'm watching, something I'm devoting a lot of time to, I just need to get rid of it. It's just it's not healthy for, for my mind and for my soul. There's different ways, but we bring holiness to completion positively by doing many of the things that we do here together. We gather with believers to worship because we are spiritually united with believers. We are equal with believers. We delve into God's word and read it and study it and apply it for ourselves. We come before God in prayer and these things we do together and individually. And we gather and we come around the Lord's table and we fight off sin, we kill it by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it means not having union or partnerships in a way that would confuse us and lead us away from God and lead us into sin. Getting rid of those things, anything that would draw us away from Christ, anything that would lead us to sin and to worship of idols, to focus on God and Him alone and worship Him alone. So what about us this morning as we think about this? Is there anything in our lives, in your life, that you need to get rid of today? Perhaps detach from today. Remove yourself from today. Something that encourages worship of something else or someone else. Maybe some kind of sin that is leading you away from the worship of God. Idols in your life that need to be removed or need to be put in their proper place. 
Are you yoked in a way that is pulling you away from God, tripping you up in your race, leading you away? And we have no place for idols in our life. We are to seek to be a holy witness, totally devoted to him and him alone. Not, not hiding from the world. And then, you know, you, th- you remember the, the monks and the ascetics that would go out into the desert, totally forgetting that the problem was in their own heart. So they were just taking it with them wherever they went. You, you can't hide from your own sin. You can't hide from your own idols. Um, but we don't hide from the world. Uh, but go out into the world and shine for Christ to the lost people and the lost souls around us. Let's pray that God would use us in such a way this week that people would see our devotion to him and to him alone, our worship of him and him alone, and that we might share uh, Christ with him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are a good God who has made your dwelling amongst us, that you live within us by your Holy Spirit. Uh, Lord, that you are in the work of cleansing us from sin and from idols. And we pray that you would do that today, that you would purify us and make us more like your son, Jesus. That you would give us wisdom in the way we conduct ourselves in the world, that we would shine as lights in the darkness to a lost world around us, knowing that we ourselves were in that same place. And Lord, we want to take this opportunity uh, to repent of our sins again and, and Lord, to devote ourselves to you once again. Thank you for your grace to us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you that you are at work to make us holy. Uh, Thank you uh, for all you have done in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn together is Take Time to Be Holy and Speak Off with God.